Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. It's Bullseye. Maybe you're stuck at home, just like I am. If you are, now is a great time to watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, if you haven't already. It's my favorite sitcom on network television. The premise for Brooklyn Nine-Nine isn't really groundbreaking. Essentially, it's funny cop show. The Nine-Nine is a precinct in Brooklyn, but it could be in almost any big city. The cops are good at their job, and you're reminded about that every now and then by a clever case solution or a quick cut action sequence. But neither of those things are really the point of the show. It's a deeply warm, deeply funny office comedy with a lot of great jokes, so many jokes. The police at the precinct care about their jobs and they care about each other. The show was created by my guest, Dan Gore, along with Mike Schur. And Dan is now the day-to-day showrunner of the show. Let's listen to a little bit from the show's latest season, which is airing now. The season kicks off with a kind of role switch. Raymond Holt, the precinct's captain, is played by Andre Brower. Holt has been demoted to patrolman for a year. That means Holt is now a subordinate to all of the detectives that used to work under him, including Jake Peralta, played by Andy Samberg. On the first episode of the new season, there has been a crisis. Someone attempted to assassinate a city councilor, and the shooter is still at large. The 9-9 is on it, with Peralta taking charge of the scene. But there's one snack. Patrol officer Raymond Holt is already on the scene, ready to take orders. Kind of. Detective, I thought I saw a clue on the sidewalk. I apologize for not properly securing the scene. No need to apologize. I wasn't even that mad. You said you wanted whoever messed up off the case. It doesn't matter. The point is, no one needs to get in trouble. Look, you don't have to pity me just because Madeline once demoted me for a year. I've been stripped of my accomplishments and lost the respect of everyone in my life, including my dog. Cheddar? No. Yes. Now, he only poops for Kevin. Oh, sir. We don't have time to take all this in. There's a shooter on the loose. Are you guys gonna be okay working together or not? Of course we will. I took an oath to protect the city no matter what my rank. I have no problem with Detective Peralta being my commander. And I have no problem commanding him. Here, watch this. Captain, will you please lock down North 3rd Street if that's okay with you, Captain? It certainly is. Impressed? You said please and you called him Captain twice. We don't have time for this, Lieutenant. There's a shooter on the loose. Dan, welcome to Bullseye. It's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. So when you conceived of Brooklyn Nine-Nine some years ago, in what I gather was a series of breakfast meetings with Mike Schur, yes, what was the piece that made it make sense to you? I think the, the, the thing that really made it make sense to me was the fact that it was a police station, that we would be able to lean on the history of cop comedy and buddy cop comedy and also really utilize the sort of vocabulary of cop television shows as a shortcut so that people would instantly recognize the world and feel comfortable in it. One of the things about this show is that while not every episode is procedural in nature, most are driven by crimes and solving a crime, two-thirds maybe. Yeah, I'd say a half to two thirds. I mean, one of the things we really tried to do right off the bat was say, look, there are three types of sh- of episodes we can do. We can do really policey, crime driven episodes. We can do office driven episodes that really feel like they belong on a show like The Office, um, and we can do relationship episodes for the A story. And hopefully, every story, every sorry episode has some element of all three of those. So you might have a story where Jake is catching a serial killer. Rosa uh, has gone on a date with a with a new girlfriend and Scully and Hitchcock and Terry have to clean up the office for spring cleaning. Like that would be a really well in fact I should write that down. That seemed like a We're recording so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Good news. Hopefully it won't get edited out but well, rival police sitcoms may steal those storylines. <laughs> yeah, those incredibly generic storylines. <laughs> you don't get them. They'll have to rename their characters, but I bet they're willing to do it. Yeah. Um had you watched a lot of police television, dramatic or comic, before you undertook this effort? I had watched, I mean, I'd watched my fair share of Barney Miller, and I'd watched shows like Law and & Order, and I, I think really in the police world, 
screen world, I was more familiar with movies like 48 Hours or Beverly Hills Cop um, and the potential for comedy or Die Hard. I mean, I'm a huge, I don't know if you can tell from watching the show, <laughs> a huge Die Hard fan. Lethal Weapon, there's such a history of mixing the action and the comedy. And obviously, we wanted to be more comedy focused. I think on Parks and Recreation, the show that you worked on before this show, there is a whole world of sweet-tempered tryhards who identify very deeply with the show and its characters, like really, really deeply. Do police officers like your show? You know, we have actually heard that a lot of police officers do like our show. But I think the people have you ever who... tried to use it to get out of a traffic ticket? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that's a stupid question. Not a traffic but... ticket, but murder, and it worked. <laughs> Congratulations! Thank you. Now, uh, I hear hope me it out. was a righteous murder. <laughs> it was a right righteous, but not in the sense of being Legal. just a yes, yeah, um, righteous like the old righteous, yeah, like the righteous brothers mm -hmm. who are murderers. I imagine, <laughs> yeah, um, I imagine the same. <laughs> um, We've gotten that, and I'm always a little bit surprised uh, when we do get that, that that cops like it. We Early on in season one, um, a, we had a police consultant who was on the NYPD. Our main police consultants are here in L.A., and he said, hey, uh, a lot of the guys like the show, but there's um, a really big complaint. And I was like, oh, man, you know, what did we do? And he's like, you've called Terry a sergeant. But his badge is, it's not a sergeant's badge. And everyone has noticed. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, well, we can change that. Now, our prop master, who's an amazing guy, was horrified and embarrassed. But we did, <laughs> you'll be so mad if he ever hears this. But we did change that out. Um, I think, though, the characters with whom, about whom we get that kind of comment, that comment about identification, are really mostly Rosa and Amy. And especially Rosa. So we've really gotten, like every time we've done a Comic-Con, um, we get really heartfelt and earnest and beautiful to hear comments about how meaningful it is to to fans of Rosa and Amy to see them on screen, especially to see Rosa, who's out about her sexuality. Um, and so that, that's, it's, I'd say that's where the point of identification is, less than cops who are like, uh, I really identify with Jake. I think that the way he solves cases is exactly the way I solve cases. Let's talk a little bit about your life and the career that led to Brooklyn Nine-Nine. You went to a uh, university called Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of comedy writers have gone. But you didn't write on their famous humor publication. The Lampoon. The Lampoon. So I was trying to say that the way you said Harvard. Um, the Lampoon. The Lampoon. Is that how we I said? didn't. I, I did a lot of comedy performing. I did improv, and I was friends. Mike was on the Lampoon. I was friends with a lot of people on the Lampoon. But yeah, I came at at writing more from a, a performing standpoint. I did a lot of plays and improv. Um, so I came at it from that from that point of view. I, it, as a kid, I was really into writing, and I was actually just telling my daughters this because they're both into writing. But I was always scared to write comedy. I I, I think I thought of myself as I wanted to seem smart and I wanted to seem serious, but really, I was just scared. I was scared that I would write I I would write something I thought of as a Woody Allen short story, and it would not be funny. And I identified I think to some extent myself as a funny person, and the idea that I would try and fail was its classic underachiever kind of uh, mentality. I always wrote as if it was going to be read by somebody, you know, which was a mistake. I was never free about the way I wrote. Um, but I also wrote, I wrote in seventh grade, I had, I mean, I don't want to bore people with my whole creative writing history, but I took a creative writing class and I produced a book you, you, of poems and short stories. It was called Dodecahedron, which is a 12-sided figure. I had read that that was the case. And the, the main poem went, Dodecahedron, 12 angry men. Dodecahedron, sit in judgment of one. I mean, I was so ridiculously self-serious. Was then it again, about a jury? It was about a jury passing a death sentence on a guy. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And again, I was a guy who, I was a kid who joked around a lot. It wasn't like I was wearing all black and, you know, 
quoting Camus at people. I just, I think I just had some insecurity that made me write like I was Thomas Mann. <laughs> <laughs> you ended up getting a job on Parks and Recreation uh, before it had a name or even actors attached to it. When it was untitled the like vague sure, idea Daniels. Yeah, yeah like the idea the vague idea of a spin off of the office like the office was successful they had given some people from the office the opportunity to make a show vaguely in the mold of the office maybe an actual spin off of the office it wasn't clear yeah so um i'd known mike for a long time i'd known him in college we'd done a lot of comedy together and he asked uh, me and uh, Charlie Grandy, the guy who had been my writing partner, we were no longer writing partners, to come out. And we interviewed for jobs at, at the office and at this putative Mike Schur, Greg Daniels project. And I think from very early on, Mike knew that it, it, he wanted it to be about government, about not not necessarily exactly what about government. And it wasn't clear who the lead was going to be. And then I think they met with Aziz, I think shortly thereafter, but they might have met with him just before then. So uh, they knew they wanted Aziz in the world. And they met with Aubrey really early on. We all met with Aubrey. And Aubrey we, Plaza. We, Aubrey Plaza, sorry. And knew that we wanted her to be a part of it. Um, and then when it became clear that Amy was available. Amy Poehler. Sorry, Amy Poehler <laughs> um, was available. And interested, it was like a, such a no-brainer. I mean, it was so huge. Ironically, as somebody who was working on the show, it was really difficult because I had quit my job at Conan. My wife had quit her job as a lawyer. And the this show this had been given a 13-episode order. But when they hired Amy, she was pregnant, and they had cut the order back down to six episodes. And so, And you're paid by the episode. So all of a sudden this new life became very scary where we went from having two jobs to having half of one job. But that actually meant, ended up being really wonderful also, not only because Amy had a baby, which was wonderful for her, but I got to work on The Office for a couple of months sort of as a consultant, which is an ironic title because I was really just, it was like more that I was a student and um, got to learn how they made that show and sit in the writer's room and pitch jokes, but really sit with Mindy Kaling, sit with Lee and Jean, uh, uh, Jean Stupnitsky and Lee Eisenberg. These are all like really excellent writers uh, who were there. And so it, it, it felt like I got a, a little bit of a head start when we started uh, Parks and Rec Up. I'd already been in a room where we were writing, we were breaking stories in the Greg Mike Greg Daniels, Mike Schur, Manor, and where we were writing Talking Heads and sort of uh, approaching comedy in that way, maybe. Was there a realization or any talk about the tone of Parks and Rec and what became, I think, the most distinctive thing about the show, which was its unusual, sweet earnestness in the context of a you know, in the context of a comedy show written by a bunch of comedy snobs? I wouldn't say we were comedy snobs, but uh, we just like laughing at things and comedy in general. But, like, there had been a certain kind of earnestness in American sitcoms, but it was mostly, like, very special episode type stuff. Right, 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 right. And that was a different kind of, like, there are people who worked on every episode of Punky Brewster who are great at doing that, that probably wasn't the kind of people who were working on that show, and that wasn't the kind of earnestness that I saw in that show as a viewer. I feel like, from the outside, someone had to choose. At the end of the day, this show is a show about loving people who care about each other, even more than most sitcoms. I mean, I think that that came from the people writing it. I think that that is true of Mike. You know, I think that he is a good hearted person. And um, I think it came from the way in which we wanted people to root for the characters. And I think that I think Mike and I think the writers in general had a belief that government can be good and can do good things. And therefore, the way in which those employees were portrayed in the same way that that we can't portray our police officers as 
being completely the ones we're following at least as being completely incompetent and or else we sort of lose the faith of the audience i think i think that that was true also for these civil employees and i think it had to do with the casting too i think that amy poehler is is able i think it's sometimes difficult to be a person who can be funny while being nice and while doing good and i think amy and i think andy samberg also are people who are just they there's a decency to them and the way in which they do comedy is not hurtful and it sometimes feels disingenuous when it is i mean andy the other day a couple years ago rather was had to do a roast i forget which one of the roasts and he went up there and he roasted himself. Or there was one where he roasted himself and the other one where his roast was just saying nice things about the victim of the roast. It's like it's it was like he was physically incapable of of being a a, a mean person. We'll wrap up with Dan Gore after the break. Stay with us. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. This is NASA. Uh, I see a flat Earth, but we should lie to everybody about it and say it's round 10-4. Maximum Fun brings you the latest podcast, an expose on the flat Earth. I want to take advantage of humankind and make them believe a lie so that they will trust us at the government. It's all an elaborate lie, and when you get on a plane, they purposefully fly you farther than you need to go. It's disgusting. It needs to be stopped. And if you listen to Ono, Ross, and Carrie, we will tell you the truth behind the lies. I just kidding. kidding. No, we no. won't do that. We will just tell you the truth behind the truth because what we do is we look at extraordinary claims. That's right. We've gone undercover with alternative medical treatments, fringe religious groups, fringe science claims, the spiritual, paranormal. We're there to check it out and let you know what happens. Is the Queen Mary haunted? I don't know. Find out. We show up. We make friends. We learn what happens when you ask questions and we tell you all about it. And we get all that funky stuff done to us. It's Ono, oh Ross, and Carrie at MaximumFun.org. Listen to Planet Money for all kinds of weird and interesting stories that just happen to teach you a bit about money and the economy and how the world works. Planet Money from NPR. Subscribe now. I'm Jesse Thorne. You're listening to Bullseye. I'm talking with Dan Gore. He co-created Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is in the middle of its seventh season right now on NBC. I had a few jobs in city government and and I really liked them and liked the people that I worked with and one of the reasons was they're largely civil service jobs that people get because they applied for them that are stable and they didn't get them because they knew somebody and so it's just like a real broad group of people from the place where you live and they're all pretty committed and hardworking and competent. And you're like, this is a great place I live in. People have much more complicated feelings. Like there is there is a pretty simple story that you can say, we're telling a story about government and how the people there are decent. And certainly there are people who hate government. And you had, you know, Ron Swanson on the show who who hated government despite working in, in it. Right. Or because he he worked in it because he hated it was the at least the original intent. Yeah. <laughs> but people have much more complicated feelings about police officers. Hmm. And I wonder if that was something that you were thinking about right from the start or whether it was something that you sort of realized in the in the course of making the show. It's something we really realized in the course of making the show. I think the Black Lives Matter movement, um, obviously these problems have been around forever, but the sort of national prominence and and place in the headlines really started around our season three or four, two or three, and so it wasn't really a thing that we were thinking about. I mean, we were thinking about aspects of the police and the way in which they deal with the public, and we wanted to make, we never wanted to glorify police violence in any way or make them bad cops. It was really important to us that they were good cops. It was important to us that they followed the rules but were smart. And some of that was also Andy's really doofy. And so we wanted to make sure, we thought he was only believable as a cop if we made him a good cop, if he's like, bad as a cop and also a total doof, you're like, eh, there's no reality to this. And in some ways, the show, 
you know, you're as much in dialogue with a history of police television shows as you are in dialogue with actual police officers. Right. As as the show presented itself at the, at the very beginning. Right. Right. And then so the other thing that happened was, I think, from the very beginning, unintentionally, we kind of created a group that models and also Holt. So Holt, as the dad, was a tough kind of dad. And he wanted he wanted them to be the best precinct in history because this was his shot. So right away, the directive from the top was, I want the best cops there. I want the best precinct ever. And the directive from the bottom from from Jake was, I want to be the best cop ever. So. You know, and their and their conflict was over method, but never about an illegal method. And, you know, it actually ended up being one of the things I think people really like about the show because it ultimately, obviously, it meant that everyone became was on the same page. But as writers, it was very difficult because very quickly, what's the conflict between a person who wants their squad to be great and a squad that wants to be great? And then you have to find sort of interpersonal conflicts and or circumstantial conflicts to to help. Uh, create stories. So we were really modeling, I think, in some ways, unintentionally, what good cops should be like. But then always showing, I mean, in our first seasons, we often had them deal with bad cops or dirty cops and have to make moral decisions. I think our second episode was called The Tagger, and in it, a a deputy commissioner is asking for special privilege, special favors for his son who is uh, spray painting penises on police cars and Holt stands up to him and says, we were, we're not going to do the wrong thing. So it's a thing we were aware of on some level and we're, we're trying to navigate on some level. And then once it really came to prominence and was something we were reading about and caring about a lot, we really became committed to doing an episode that dealt with it head on. And it just took us a while to figure out how to do that episode, how to do that episode in a way that was meaningful, but also still funny, still felt like Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And then ultimately that led to the episode Moo Moo, where Terry is racially profiled. Terry, while wearing civilian clothing, is racially profiled by an NYPD officer. Were you scared to do something? Like, did you have ever have the... Yes. Uh, the feeling like, mm, I don't want to do after school, tele- uh, like after school special. Well, either that or just like, uh, the, let's just make this a world where only goofy things happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we, we began to feel like it's going to seem like our heads are in the sand. Um, and one could certainly look at the fact that we've done 143 episodes <clears throat> and there are plenty of episodes where only goofy things happen. So maybe maybe our heads are partially in the sand still. But it, it, it was a story we really wanted to tell, and we felt like we couldn't avoid telling it. We had to figure out how. And once we figured it out, we were really happy with the outcome. How do you uh, check in that when you are writing storylines about such a diverse group of characters and uh, you yourself are like a classic caricature of a guy who would be the boss of a sitcom – uh, in the, you're a, you know, a straight, a straight white guy who went to Harvard and like, uh, got a job right out of college with his improv buddy. Yeah. I thought you were going to say uh, stunningly handsome. Oh yeah. Uh, most, uh, most television writers are known for their good looks yeah. first and foremost. I live in a bubble. How do you check in that when you have, for example, you know, Stephanie Beatrice's character, uh, coming out as bi and she herself is bi. Or Andre Brower, a uh, big part of his character from the beginning has been uh, his husband and the, you know, around the edges of his experience as a police officer and him wanting to be a good police officer has always been because he was the victim of discrimination within the police department for both race and uh, orientation reasons. How do you keep that ship on track in a way that is both kind of like sees people for who they are and is not patronizing? I think the there are several things. I think one, um, really striving towards having a lot of diversity on the staff and the crew is very helpful and being open to everyone's opinions and ideas and viewpoint. And then two, um, really being in communication with the actors themselves. So for Rosa coming out, I mean, Stephanie herself was so integral to helping us break that story and to talking about what she felt was really important for that character to say. She wanted the character to say, I'm bisexual. 
and to use those words because that's a thing that a character, a main character on a TV show who gets to live has almost never said before. And she knew that. And it was important to her that those words were said. And similarly, when we broke the the story about Terry being racially profiled, we spent a lot of time talking to Terry about his own experiences with that. And then the thing that actually broke that story open was a conversation with Andre. He said, every time we've portrayed Captain Holt having to deal with racism or homophobia, he's taken it. And he's taken it for a reason. And the reason he's taken it is that he believes he will be more effective if he can make systemic change. And the way for him to make systemic change is to is to climb up the ranks and then eventually be commissioner, make systemic change. So we had this argument and it's an argument it's a legitimate argument on both sides. And we had this argument between Holt and Terry. It was the only time we've really ever done this in an episode. They're sitting in two chairs opposite of each other, having an argument over the course of an entire act. And Terry basically says, I hear you, but I think it's BS. I'm going to hand in the complaint. Uh, consequences be damned. And then at the end... Because the, I think the thing that we've really learned when we do these episodes is not to sugarcoat anything. At the end, Terry has made the report. The guy has been demoted, but Terry was up for a promotion of his own, and he doesn't get it. And he says to Holt, do you think it's because I, I handed in that complaint? And Holt says, I don't know, maybe, probably, but I'm proud you did it. And you see that the world isn't, it's not all roses and unicorns and candy canes. And uh, that there are consequences, crappy consequences sometimes, but they have each other's back. Well, Dan, I'm so grateful you took this time to talk about uh, your life in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I love the show so much. Like uh, oh, That makes watch, me so happy. Really, really do watch every episode, and I'm, I'm really grateful you came in. I'm so flattered that you asked me, and thank you so much. I love your show, and this has been a blast. Dan Gore. Brooklyn Nine-Nine airs Thursday nights on NBC. You can stream all seven seasons, including the new episodes, right now on Hulu. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is currently produced out of the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around Los Angeles, California. Now, normally we would give you an update on what's happening outside our office in MacArthur Park, but instead, uh, here at my house, uh, my wife overheard this exchange between my six-year-old son and eight-year-old daughter after my daughter noticed that there was some whipped cream in the fridge. She said to him, hey, I noticed we have a little something that goes on top of hot cocoa in a blue spray bottle in the fridge. My son Oscar said, Gatorade? Show's produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien. Our production fellow is Jordan Cowling. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team. Thanks to them and their label Memphis Industries for letting us use it. And... We have decades of interviews in the can. If you're home and bored or uh, doing important work and want a less important distraction, uh, check out our back catalog. Like, if you like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, we had on Stephanie Beatrice, who plays Rosa Diaz. Uh, She was absolutely uh, wonderful. She's a a gifted actress and uh, a really cool, funny lady who actually was the inspiration for her character, being bi because she herself is uh, bisexual. And we also had Terry Crews, perhaps the most magnetic human being on earth, Uh, certainly one of the top 10 most defined sets of pectoral muscles on earth. Uh, He talked about all kinds of things, including but not limited to his love of minivans. Find those on our website, the bullseye page at MaximumFun.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. You can keep up with the show there. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. 